going to say five, four, three, two, one. Mayo, mayo. Works until lunchtime, so we're off to Robbie's house. <laughs> one of them's golden hour. Today's funnies on BBC Two come from the one and only Armando Iannucci. Go fighting's exciting. Discover discussion. Swap guns for tongues. And charm for concussion. Envelop your foes in one massive kiss. And come to Thanks. You know, sometimes I think it just isn't physically possible to applaud a man as much as you've just done. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is the Saturday Night Armistice. I'm Armando Iannucci. Imagine Hugh Scully melted down to the shape of a child. <laughs> but crack my face with a rock, we've got a good show for you tonight. It's all about tennis. <laughs> Officials worried that fast servers made tennis too boring are uh, trying to slow the game down by moving it from grass to water. <laughs> Court number 12 was flooded to make play more exciting. <laughs> and spectators weren't disappointed when at one point Joe Jury drowned. <laughs> and talking of large, useless objects struggling for survival at the bottom of the sea, <laughs> the Channel Tunnel this week started a new service to attract children and families by opening up its new corkscrew tunnel. <laughs> allowing passengers to take a train <laughs> that, that twists and turns on a sickening ride to France. <laughs> Meanwhile, the ferry industry competed more directly with the tunnel <laughs> by opening its new cross-channel underwater canal service. <laughs> on Wednesday, Liz Hurley announced she was standing by Hugh Grant after he sat on a whore. <laughs> However, by Thursday, Grant announced he was resigning from his post as Hugh Grant. <laughs> thus opening the way up for a challenge, eventually won by Norman Lamont. <laughs> Joining me perpetually on the Saturday Night Armistice are Peter Bainham and David Schneider and their 14 clothes. And uh, I wonder if we could start with you, Peter, if yeah. you could just talk us through uh, one of the seven clothes you're wearing. Certainly, Amanda. Well, this cloth here is mm. a pair of trousers. Right, so, so how do they work? Very, very simple. I get up in the morning, yeah. and what I do is I pour my legs into these two fabric pipes. <laughs> yeah. Much like water running down a pair of drain pipes. Yeah. And I wait at the bottom with my shoes. <laughs> right. <clears throat> do you ever find that sometimes your feet uh, overflow your shoes? No. <laughs> Right, David, uh, you're wearing something interesting. Yeah, well, I'm wearing a bit of a tribute to the late Liz Hurley tonight. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm, I'm actually wearing that jacket. <laughs> I don't know if you can see that. And, uh, I'm underneath that, I'm also modelling that shirt. <laughs> Thanks very much for that. <laughs> now it's time to meet the little fellow who made such a big impression last week that we had to slap him. Here he is. Uh, he has fun with all the guys. He's got buttons in his eyes. He's Mr. Tony Blair. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, what have you been up to this week, Mr. Tony Blair? You've been to Europe <laughs> on a big meeting. I, I don't believe that. <laughs> You've got documentary evidence. <laughs> Who's that? Tony Blair, you've been to Euro Disney. <laughs> and you met Donald Duck. Because he's your opposite number in France. <laughs> but you were scared of him because he smelt of patty. <laughs> Mr. Tony Blair, you really are a cloth fool, aren't you? 
Well, more from Tony later. Uh, but before we spit on about the Tory leadership race, uh, just a quick explanation about how the actual election procedure will work on Tuesday. Um, what happens is next Tuesday, uh, <laughs> Sir Marcus Fox is going to go into a booth with one of these, which <laughs> is a Conservative leadership scratch card, um, or Westminster, as it's called. <laughs> Clever play on words there. And uh, he'll take out a coin and he'll scratch away. And uh, underneath each square, there is a face of uh, either John Major or John Redwood. And it's the first face to get four squares <laughs> is the winner. Well, we've only got three Majors and three Redwoods there, so we go to a second rollover scratch card the following week <laughs> uh, with a possible jackpot of two Prime Ministers. <laughs> What's really frustrating at the moment is that the real big guns in the Cabinet about the leadership, they can't declare their intentions. They have yeah. to get, get their friends to declare their intentions. Like, I mean, it's a bit like when you're feeling very shy and too shy to ask someone out. Mm, yeah. And, like, I mean, Michael Portillo, he quite fancies the Conservative Party. <laughs> yes. But he's too shy to go up and say, so mm. he sort of mentioned it to his friend. But he said, please don't tell anyone, but his friend's gone and blurted it out. <laughs> now, everyone knows he fancies the Conservative Party, and he's just anywhere, he walks anywhere, it's just everyone <laughs> the thing is with these people, you've really got to read between the lines with what they say. I mean, literally. Yeah. Absolutely literally. I mean, look at this letter, right, which um, Michael Portillo wrote the other day. Now, I'll bring this up to the camera to show you this. Now, you really do have to read between the lines, because look at this. It's the usual twattery about, like, you know, further to recent spe press speculation, all that crap about I don't want to be Prime Minister. But if you look down here, in tiny letters, I am standing really... <laughs> Ha, 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 ha. I've, uh, I've got another letter here. This was from Michael Heseltine, and he doesn't quite manage to sustain it. Um, I fully support the Prime Minister, though if he were to fail to secure sufficient votes to avoid a second ballot, and if I were in turn asked to stand in the interests of the party, I'd love to. <laughs> It's not just what they say or what they write, it's actually mm. body language can tell you a lot about mm. a voting yeah. intention. But if you, if you look at the lobbies now, and if you look at the Eurosceptics, for example, they're walking in a sort of figure of eight dance, a, a bit like bees, yeah? And uh, when they get to the end of the dance, they sort of direct their votes <laughs> at the uh, leadership candidate they want. So there's actually 40 of them going like this to Michael Portillo. <laughs> Very good. I, uh, I saw... Uh, Peter Lilly, right? Peter Lilly. No one knows quite how his way works, but I saw him the other day. He was just walking very quietly down Westminster like that. <laughs> right? And then all of a sudden, this enormous peacock fan. <laughs> <laughs> With the words John Redwood <laughs> written across the feathers, right? And then it just snapped back again, and then he just, uh, he just walked off. <laughs> If only we could understand what that meant. Yes. <laughs> Actually, the, the one person we haven't talked about is, is John Redwood, because his body language is the weirdest, mm. because it all comes from his eyes. <laughs> these weird, piercing eyes. And uh, we've got them here. We have. <laughs> there they are. There you go. There you are. John um, Redwood's I don't know if you can eyes. see those. Here they are. <laughs> What's the matter? <laughs> I mean, we had to hold him down, obviously. I mean... <laughs> I mean, the left one just popped out. We had to get the right one out with a spoon. <laughs> Very nice, though. Since they were gouged out, uh, he does look a lot better. <laughs> uh, he's been winning more votes. He really has. Have you heard what he's doing in, in Wales as Welsh Secretary, when he was Welsh Secretary? No. Uh, terrible. Look, he's, this is a £10 note from the Bank of Wales, right? Mm. Look. <laughs> Nobody's noticed what he's been doing in Wales, have they? No. Nobody's no. noticed. I don't know if you know this. He's directed the whole of the funds for the Welsh National Opera Building into building up a massive slave Welsh army. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it, it goes worse than that. There's a whole military operation going on in Wales. Um, uh, we got to these pictures and uh, look at that military parade there. <laughs> no, that's, that's going on in Cardiff or John Redwood Sector One, as it's now called. <laughs> And uh, these troop build-ups are going on all over Wales. And there they are landing. <laughs> That's Snowden. This is, this is stuff. Look, he's bombing Cardiff Central Station. If we can just give you 
some sense of what this build-up means, um, with the aid of a few stickers here and a map, um, you can see that uh, right along the Anglo-Welsh border there's been a huge build-up of, of tanks, of infantry, over 350,000 troops. That's the fifth largest army in the world now, is the Welsh army. And down here, the whole of the Moroccan navy is standing by. <laughs> You know, Morocco is twinned with Wales. <laughs> and uh, they're going to land at Minehead Butlins. And then, then the plan is, once they've seized Butlins, they're going to march on Bristol. They're going to take Bristol, yeah? They will then be joined by the Northern Force sweeping down here to Bristol, and they're then going to take the train to London. <laughs> you notice up here, there is a massive supergun at the top of Snowdon, which is pointed at Manchester. So some good's come of all this. John Redwood still has one final audacious masterstroke up his sleeve, right? What he's done is, by careful targeting of environmental grants at different beaches, he has ensured that over the next 1,000 years, the Welsh coastline will slowly erode into the shape of his own face. <laughs> I mean, that's the man we're dealing with here. Uh, OK, uh, time to drive away from the whore of politics for a bit and go cruising around a completely different topic <laughs> until the police have gone. <laughs> and have you ever wondered what the men and women who people BBC costume dramas do when they're not wandering around beautiful country locations or standing on rugs? <laughs> To find out, we followed a female costume drama figure on her day off, starting with her visit to a shop. <laughs> Good morning. Sir, yes. would you wrap this for me and place it upon my account? Send it, if you will, to this address. Thank you. Please, do not say who sent it. Our costume drama woman, and more from the skirted oddity later. Peter, the miniaturised area. Oh, yes, of course, right. Over to our tiny little modern desk here, and it's time again to utterly abuse my worldwide network of security cameras for the good of mankind. So let's use our eyes as noses, but noses that can see. <laughs> to go sniffing around the private lives of the famous. Dave, you have a go. Who do oh, you want to smell? Uh, all right, Norman Lamont, please. Norman oh, yes. Lamont. Okay, the Norman Lamont. Let's okay. put him up there. What's he going to be? It's that news agent he goes to, isn't it? Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. Right. <laughs> there you go. Now we should get him up on here. There he is. He's the bit you normally see. Now he should be. There he goes into the news agent. Then he gets his porn mag. <laughs> into. The... Now let's get this up on the security camera. Right. Oh, there right. he is right now. Now. Oh. Here he oh, comes into the shop. Oh, yeah. <laughs> my God! Oh, my God! <laughs> <laughs> He's filling his pockets with fruit gums. <laughs> He's just stuffing them in his jacket. The sod. My God. <laughs> right. I mean, can we play we, another Yeah, one? we can do anyone else, yeah. All I right. mean, they don't particularly have to be in the news at the moment. OK. Uh, Liz Hurley and Hugh Grant. <laughs> All right. I've been wondering about them. What's been happening to them? OK, yeah, let's okay. Look. OK, let's... Where would they be? Let's look. Hell. Right. Yes. <laughs> now, I've actually been watching these for about a year, so this is taped stuff here. OK. Now, they're not quite the golden couple that we all know and fear. I had my doubts originally. All right. Here they are, getting out of the so car. So when is this? My God, there's that prostitute in the car. <laughs> <laughs> now, when there's is... the happy smiles. This is just outside their flat. They're just right. coming into their flat. Look, there's okay. that smile there. <laughs> and, um, now, we should be able to get That's the security grand, There they go to the door of their flat. Now, let's get them on the internal security camera. Should be up any moment now. Yeah. There it is. Oh, my God! <laughs> it's a dump! Oh. Watch this, watch this. I love this watch. bit. I love this. Oh, right. right. Look at this. Watch this. Yeah. She's, oh. she's bald! No! No! Liz Hurley is bald! She's bald! Oh. I do not believe what I've seen. I was devastated. I just kept rewinding. Did you? Yes, did. <laughs> it doesn't get any better, does it? Oh, it did. We... <laughs> <laughs> Time now for more developments in tennis. And this week we had our first chance to see how play at Wimbledon was improved by the introduction of the new set of noises. With 
Divorce in Britain on the increase and children getting more and more emotionally scarred by family breakdown. It's good to know that Relate has brought the whole experience out on a great new computer game for kids. <laughs> David. That's right, the game's called Custody Warrior. And <laughs> I've been giving it a bit of a test drive. Uh, it's a beat-em-up game and the child can make its way through the whole process of divorce from the point of view of anyone involved whilst they beat the hell out of each other. Uh, so let's have a look at our rogues gallery of characters. There's mum, dad, the lawyer, uh, mum's new boyfriend, there's grandma and dad's uh, girlfriend's baby. Okay, uh, right, uh, let's, I'll tell you what, let's choose mum. She's a good fighter and her weapons are plates, which are really excellent and deadly accurate. OK, we're in level one here. It's a family home. She's fighting Dad. There she is. She's got it, yes! Finish him off. Yes, a final plate. He's had it. So she won that particular argument. She gets on to the next level, which is the courtroom. Here we are. She's fighting the lawyer here. His weapons are wigs. Watch him leap over. Um, oh, dear, this is much harder, this one. Oh, and there's legal fees. You see the legal fees mounting up. Oh, oh, oh he's got harm. There's much... No, I can't do that level. OK. Uh, on now to level three, right? This is Mum's new boyfriend's flat. She's pregnant on this level, but it's not his baby. And that's why they're beating each other up. Off they go. Um, she does the kick. Yes. Oh, knockout kick. Look at that. Well, there we are. They bust each other up. The game's over. We look at the scores, but it doesn't really matter because, of course, in these situations, nobody wins. <laughs> Something that I forgot to tell you at the start of the programme is that this show's coming from space. <laughs> We're on board a special BBC Two space station, travelling at about 13,000 miles an hour, and already 120 people in the audience have been sick. <laughs> and in about 15 minutes' time, we're going to dock with a BBC One programme of equal importance <laughs> over at our big lead pod door. Uh, but back to Earth now and the problems of making tennis more interesting. And I believe you've got a solution. I certainly do, Amanda. Now, as Armando said earlier, there's been a lot of talk lately about tennis being too fast. So over here is a fascinating idea I've had to slow the game down and so make it more interesting. Fax tennis. <laughs> to show you how this works, it's Claire to serve. Now, rather than the archaic system of actually hitting a ball back and forth across a court, which is really boring, Claire is faxing a picture of a ball <laughs> to one of Mary Jo's three machines on the other side. Now, meanwhile, Mary Jo over here has to guess which of her three fax machines the ball oh. is destined for and is faxing a picture of a racket to that machine. Now, if the ball gets through first, Claire will have scored. However, if Mary Jo's racket gets through first and to the correct machine, she will have returned serve and we'll have a rally. <laughs> Simple but gripping, I think you'll agree. <laughs> and what's this? Something's coming through, something's coming through. A ball is coming yes! through! No way! Claire has scored a point. Yes, she has scored a point. The British oh, person has come through. Absolutely fantastic. Hang on a minute. Are we going to be playing the whole match? Yes, we are, Amanda. Don't worry, viewers. We're not going to leave this game. <laughs> we'll be staying with it right to the bitter end. So, sorry to any viewers of Seinfeld, which follows this programme, as it will have to now be put back very slightly to about five o'clock on Tuesday morning. <laughs> OK, thanks, Peter. Now, what? There's, there's a ball coming Yeah, through. thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Mando. Now, next year, the chances are, if you want to watch Wimbledon International Rugby or Frank Bruno fighting Sally Gunnell, <laughs> The only way you could do it without paying is to snuggle up next to Rupert Murdoch's wife. <laughs> That's because the small, ugly Australian mammal she's married to <laughs> has bought the rights to most sports, which means the BBC no longer has access to big events. Undeterred, from now on, the corporation will be using undercover camcorder equipment <laughs> to bring you all this year's sporting action. <laughs> Afternoon. Well, there's a great deal of high-class sport going on in a number of locations this afternoon. Let's take a look at the afternoon's cricket third day in the current round of the <laughs> 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 Now, soccer and today's action in the Ambro Cup was Sweden against Japan at the City Ground. <laughs> <laughs> commentary from John Chen. We're going to take you straight now to another major sporting occasion. Uh, coverage of the ladies' singles final at the French Open <laughs> Tennis. <laughs> That's all good, though. Bye for now. There, 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 
there are some sports that they can't get into at all, I think, like boxing, so what they have to do is send along a courtroom sketch artist to draw a picture. <laughs> it really make, makes you feel you're there, doesn't it? <laughs> OK, uh, more sport now. How's it going with the facts tennis, Peter? Very exciting, very exciting. There was a bit of an amusing incident earlier when this came through. It's an arse. <laughs> so we have a streaker. <laughs> and it appears to be from Jonathan Aitken, MP. <laughs> so thanks for staying in touch, Jonathan. Very good. Cheers, Pete. Europe. That word casts a strange smell on the imagination. <laughs> if you think of Disneyland, you think of a fun-filled playground where the corpses of Mickey Mouse and Pluto are brought back to life for the amusement of children. <laughs> if you think of Euro Disney, you think of windswept families wandering over tarmac, littered with puddles and Goofy's turds. <laughs> so what does Europe do to us, exactly? Here's me. Some MPs tell us that Europe is as exciting as copulating. But when we stare at Euro things, do we actually become moist? Just how interesting is Europe exactly? Well, in order to answer that question, I've come to the Neurophysiology Unit of the Maudsley Hospital in London in order to measure the effect Europe has on the human body. First, we found four volunteers and immediately strapped them to EEG equipment, which measures activity in the brain. A thermal camera looked at how hot they got. With this fancy equipment, we were able to measure how interested the volunteers were in a sequence of things we showed them. These included a panther killing an antelope, scenes from The Danny Baker Show, Seaforth and Big Break, footage of women in bikinis shooting guns, and a documentary on cheddaring. An extract from a European Parliament debate in Strasbourg was inserted into the sequence. <laughs> to introduce a variable into the experiment, Conservative Member of Parliament Sir Teddy Taylor also agreed to lie down and have electrodes strapped to his head. Here he is being measured watching a bus skidding. <laughs> from the printouts, it was clear that the Europe debate was having a minimal effect on our volunteers' brains, while the footage of women and pistols elicited a high response. Our Teddy Taylor variable, however, exhibited more unpredictable behaviour. The Europe discussion provoked a high juddering of the brain, while during the sequence showing near-naked women brandishing highly symbolic weaponry, he fell asleep. The volunteers were then asked to talk about what they saw. The girls firing the guns didn't know what it was all about. I mean, why would... It was basically them? about girls firing guns. But why would they want to fire guns? I mean, they might enjoy themselves and good luck yeah. to them. The tests offered conclusive evidence that people find the Danny Baker show less interesting than a skidding bus. <laughs> the European Parliament and Jim Davidson's big break caused least mental stimulation with all of our volunteers. The volunteers were asked to give an excitement value between 1 and 10 to a series of random words. And to the same words, but with euro on the front. Our analysis showed that the euro words stimulated the volunteers only half as much. So, for example, curry and cock were only half as interesting when they became euro curry and euro cock. Euro cock. Four. Something funny has happened in the last two months because I find that the whole community seems to have wakened up yes. to the problem of Europe, and I've been trying to stimulate them for years without success. Right. <laughs> well, do you think you're stimulating them now? I've tried everything. I think probably I've come to the end of the road. Is that the thing that most frustrates you, people going oh, to sleep? Yes. <laughs> people going to sleep frustrates me terribly. But on the other hand, you can stop them going to sleep. It doesn't mean they're necessarily listening. That's the yes. other thing. Yes. <laughs> so, our experiments prove that not only is Europe dull, it's dull by a factor of two. <laughs> well, thanks for joining in the debate, Sir Ted. <laughs> Peter, what are you doing back here? Again, uh, they're changing ends. <laughs> Uh, we're actually uh, now literally minutes away from the historic space docking uh, between us and a programme from BBC One. And uh, you may like to know it's another Saturday night programme we're docking with, so we could be about to create the most interesting thing in space since the moon. <laughs> uh, but at the moment, of course, we're all looking at the Mir shuttle link up. And uh, although they call it a sort of symbolic meeting, you wonder why they just didn't meet for dinner mm. or something the like that. The thing about space is that it is exactly halfway between Russia and America. <laughs> I had heard that um, Hugh Grant <laughs> and that prostitute... Yes. ..that was just a symbolic Anglo-American docking. <laughs> no. 
the beautiful old face of heterosexual decency was spattered in the eye this week by men and women all being gay. <laughs> the arrival of Gay Time TV, a programme celebrating homosexuality, on BBC Two, a channel consisting mainly of golf and cars, <laughs> is seen as yet another assault up the behind of ordinary colonels in Hertfordshire. <laughs> These colonels have recently seen off an attempt to introduce gays into the armed forces, successfully arguing that gay soldiers would find their energies distracted by affection when they should be spent on wandering drunk around Salisbury on a Saturday night <laughs> or shooting Argentinian prisoners of war after they've handed over their guns. <laughs> the announcement that Guinness, the brown male fluid with a creamy head, <laughs> will feature a gay couple in their advertising has rubbed gay Irish stout into the wounds. <laughs> and now, most surprisingly of all, this week, the sun has also decided to turn gay. <laughs> there you see it, the sun's coming out. Uh, a photo there of two men kissing with uh, three cheers for our boyfriends in the forces. <laughs> we're gay and we're proud. Uh, next page, Peter Tatchell on Saturday. Uh, the Gary Bushel columns there. And on the front, a free offer, go to San Francisco for a pound. <laughs> the church, too, calls upon traditional values, upholding that the only sex it can countenance within its walls is that between husband and wife or between priest and children. <laughs> the church tolerates gay love, provided it doesn't lead to genital acts. And some parishes, suspicious of gay priests, have been granted a concession from the diocese to wear special genital protectors when attending the local service. <laughs> and now it's time to play Hunt the Old Woman! OK, here we are in a perfectly ordinary studio audience. Some of them were sick earlier, as I said, uh, but ordinary nonetheless. But who's this? It's an old woman. <laughs> and she's going to help us play Hunt the Old Woman. <laughs> Uh, now, your name? Jean Beaton. Jean Beaton. OK, and you can confirm you are a perfectly ordinary old woman. I'm a perfectly ordinary old woman. Right, thanks. That's the confirmation we needed. <laughs> However, just take a look at this. It's last Sunday's surprise, surprise. Who's that next to Scylla? <laughs> it's Jean. Yeah, Scylla, There's Scylla doing her stuff, reuniting <laughs> angry cousins. <laughs> but it's Jean. Look. And she can clap. Now, is that a coincidence? I don't know, because we turn now to the 14th of June and on to the BBC One O'Clock News. There we that. are. <laughs> there she is. That's all there. We now flip forward to this week, the 26th of June, and as the Tory leadership race hots up, it looks like it's got a stalking old woman. <laughs> there she is. There! There! <laughs> what does that, um... Jean, what does that uh, banner that you're carrying say? I am an old woman. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Over the next few weeks, we are going to be releasing this old woman. <laughs> in front of your television and newspaper cameras all over Britain. <laughs> and her legs are keen. <laughs> Aren't they, Jean? Yes. <laughs> OK, right. So look out for her all across your media. If you see this old woman at all over the next seven days, <laughs> then write in with the time, date and place you saw her. Right? <laughs> and the first person to spot her gets this lovely Saturday night armistice hors d'oeuvre tree. <laughs> So, in the meantime, what's costume drama woman doing now? <laughs> Sir, could you help me across this... <laughs> Will no-one help me across this puddle? I must not ruin my one good gown. It's all I have left, sir. Please, some gentleman. 
Gentlemen, surely will help me across this water. Uh, meanwhile, there's been unexpected fallout from Douglas Hurd's resignation from the Foreign Office. Uh, he's been bought by Graham Sunnis <laughs> to play for Turkish football team Galatasaray. <laughs> Sunnis paid eight and a half million pounds for him, saying Hurd had experience and a couple of years left in his legs. <laughs> now, anyone interested in the plight of veal calves will know that a deal's now been struck about regulating the transportation of these delicious animals. <laughs> they can now be hauled for a limit of eight hours, after which the trucks have to stop at a service station and let them out for a toilet break. <laughs> but as the animals start wandering around petrol pumps, arcades and gift shops, <laughs> buying tartan tins of biscuits, protesters are already gathering, uh, though we've got evidence these protesters aren't what they seem because they've got knives and forks, and there's a man at the back with a huge straw that he uses to suck meat directly from the cow. <laughs> but the ones that have really suffered this week have been the Labour Party, because they brought out all their policies on education, housing, finance and so on, and nobody was interested. <laughs> <laughs> so by Friday, they just gave up and had a big party. <laughs> it's true. We went down to the headquarters at Walworth Road, right, and we sent a, a camera crew down there, and uh, this is what we saw. See that? <laughs> a riot. A riot. And when they did their finance press conference, because yeah. no one was taking any notice, they thought, for a laugh, let's do it nude. And they did. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. In fact, the only thing that we've seen all week has been that bit of grass outside Westminster with all the politicians mm. on it. And in fact, it's got so crowded now that they're going to knock down the House of Commons to build a bigger one. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just packed full now with MPs trying to get on camera. I don't know if you've yeah. noticed, but Tony Marlowe, the bloke with the funny jacket, the yeah. Eurosceptic, he just spends his whole time lawn mowing. Yes. <laughs> yes. Me? No? OK. And now I'll go. Well, just good evening. Yeah, evening. evening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, that NASA sound tells us that it's time for our historic docking with the BBC One programme. And uh, looking out the big space window, I can now reveal that that programme is Dale Winton's Pets Win Prizes. Yeah! Very exciting. Uh, these are the scenes at Mission Control. Going to take your sheep away. <laughs> Mix them with the six sheep behind. <laughs> oh yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> now we're going to try and get you to identify your own sheep, but there's a difference. We're good. And that enormous click tells us that docking is now complete. <laughs> so, this is very exciting. As a mark of respect to all the animals who will be parading out, uh, we've removed all our leather garments. Yes, I have. <laughs> I've removed my belt, leaving me with only six clothes. <laughs> now I've removed my pants. <laughs> OK, and uh, here they come. My God! <laughs> They're beautiful! <laughs> Absolutely beautiful! Marvellous. Hello! Hello. <laughs> we... Hello. <laughs> Take me to your presenter. Come over here. I, over I, here, please. I found the science officer. Excellent. <laughs> now, all these animals do now have to be rounded up, unfortunately, and taken to BBC Two research laboratories, <laughs> where they will be experimented on relentlessly to find out just why animals are so sodding popular on television. <laughs> Ducks! <laughs> and now, Ducks! And now, possibly the most exciting event since the birth of time herself. <laughs> Here he comes, the Emperor of Pets, Dale Winton! Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> He's so old. Yeah, but that is the effect of weightlessness on glamour. Uh, it just floats <laughs> off. Uh, Dale, Dale, I bring you a gift. It's a bouncing BBC Two logo. <laughs> and, and please accept this Saturday night armistice hors d'oeuvre tree with John Redwood's eyes on it from us. <laughs> and uh, thank you for your gift, which is this lovely little litter for Mr. Tony Blair. <laughs> Dale, Dale, where are you going? Dale, don't leave us. David, we are going with them. We are going with Dale Winton to BBC One. Thanks yes. very much for watching tonight's Saturday Night Armistice. Take good care of yourselves. And next week's show will be presented by a duck. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.